Hello, everyone. This is Patricia Dean, um, better known as Sia um, by all my friends, um, talking to you today uh, in our continuing webinar series. Today we're taking on a different approach um, by taking on a topic that is uh, we've never presented on before, and that is accountable care organizations. One of the disadvantages to presenting uh, over a webinar situation is not being able to ask the people in the room their experience or where they are uh, in terms of experience with ACOs. But I do know from hearing from several of you and recognizing several of your names on the attendance list that um, uh, some of you are already in an ACO arrangement. Uh, some are with an IPA, uh, Independent Practice Association, that is moving toward clinical integration um, and toward an ACO, uh, and still others uh, are considering ACOs. One of the reasons that we particularly wanted to present on this topic is because within Hohn and Hart's footprint, um, that being Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, um, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico, we there is a great deal of variability about experience with ACOs and prevalence of ACOs. And so um, uh, considering that how low the prevalence is in some of our footprint, uh, we're getting lots and lots of questions about ACOs and practices that are considering forming them. So with that small introduction, let me just remind you that this is a seminar. It is not intended to create an a attorney-client privilege or an attorney-client relationship. We're not dealing any kind of specific issues or with specific um, problems that you may be facing. Um, it's just meant for educational purposes only. What I'd like to cover today is a brief overview of ACOs, uh, where they started, where, they're, where they've been, and where they're headed. Uh, cover briefly the June 2015 final rule provisions, which obviously came out last June, um, but we're having more experience with now. I'd like to do an overview of the Medicare Shade, Shared Savings Program, excuse me, including the methodology for determining shared savings and losses and quality measures, because those are becoming ever more important. I'd like to cover a little bit about the advanced payment ACO model, since I've gotten several questions about that, especially in the last uh, two months. Uh, the new June 2016 final rule provisions, which are very, very technical and don't uh, make significant changes. They are, they're more along the lines of explaining and expanding, but we'll go over those real quickly. Key considerations when considering forming, joining, or improving an ACO. Uh, many of the ACO clients that I work with are in a position where they're trying to improve their reimbursement um, or, or their shared savings. They're trying to get better at what they're doing uh, to succeed uh, and, and be eligible for greater shared savings. So whether you're in one, considering forming one, or want to improve your ACO, um, that's what those key considerations will go to. And then I wanted to just quickly touch on the future of ACOs. So starting in with an overview, uh, lots of people are confused about where the term ACO comes from because it didn't just uh, spring out of the Affordable Care Act. In fact, the term was originally coined in 2006 by uh, Dr. Fisher, who was the director of Center of Health Policy and Research at Dartmouth Medical School. The ACO concept uh, has different definitions depending on who you're talking to. If you're dealing with a private ACO, uh, it may have a slightly different definition as compared to the shared savings program under Medicare, uh, compared to um, other arrangements that are being bandied about. But the general concept is that uh, it can generically be defined as a group of healthcare providers, potentially including doctors, hospitals, long-term care facilities, home health care providers, health plans, behavioral health providers, and any other health care constituents who voluntarily come together to provide coordinated, high-quality care to populations of patients and typically do so on some sort of risk basis. The goal is to ensure that patients and populations, especially the chronically ill, that's really what ACOs are, are set up to handle, get the right care at the right time and without harm while avoiding care that has no proven benefit or represents an unnecessary duplication of services. The whole, the cornerstone of ACOs is coordination. According to a recent Health Affairs article, um, which I would suggest to anyone, um, you can just Google Health Affairs April 21, 
Um, as of junior 30th, excuse me, January 30th, there were 838 active ACOs across the country with services in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So they are now widespread. Collectively, uh, the count of ACOs has grown by 94 over the past year. I'm sure that is, that was as of the end of January. I'm sure that number is higher now that we're in August. But it's an increase of 12.6%. So they're continuing to proliferate and grow. Um, growth has continued to vary across the country and across public and private health insurance programs with significant growth in most population centers, but we're also starting to see some real activity in rural areas. And the Levitt partners estimate that 28.3 million people are now covered by an accountable care arrangement. And the Levitt partners, uh, they do a yearly review of ACOs. They are the experts in counting and quantifying and qualifying uh, ACOs. So any materials you see from them, they're, they're very, very good at uh, reporting on ACO development. The uh, concept of ACOs was adopted by the Affordable Care Act. So obviously the, the concept predated uh, the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act uh, really adopted the concept. Section uh, 3022 of the ACA amended Title 18 of the Social Security Act by adding a whole new section, Section 1899, called the Shared Savings Program. So often people will conflate the concept of an ACO with the medical, uh, with the Medicare Shared Savings Program. But frankly, uh, the ACA created the Shared Savings Program, which then became part of the ACO network. So under the Shared Savings Program, an ACO is a network of primary care practitioners, specialists, hospitals, home health care providers, and other essential practitioners that share financial and medical responsibility for providing coordinated care to patients in hopes of limiting unnecessary spending. And what is key about an ACO is primary care. So the primary care physician becomes the, the hub of the ACO will. Frankly, I've talked with groups that don't have good primary care and are talking about becoming an ACO, and what my advice to them always is, is you need essential primary care that will, that will be the hub for referring to all the other specialists in the ACO. The uh, primary care piece is, is the most central. The central idea of an ACO is having all aspects of a patient's care uh, in, in one group that will limit duplication and improve efficiency, thereby lowering the cost of care while improving quality. ACOs come in a variety of configurations, including associations of physician groups, hospitals, post-acute care providers, behavioral health providers, and others. So they can look a lot, uh, look, they can come in a lot of different forms. They can look differently. But the common thread is a contract or arrangement that provides incentives for the provider to improve the quality and lower the cost of care for that particular population. So again, there has to be some sort of arrangement, and that is how ACOs differ from clinically integrated networks. So this figure uh, is from the uh, Health Affairs article, and it shows ACOs over time. You can see that they've uh, proliferated uh, significantly through the first quarter of 2016. And that was just a graphic to uh, demonstrate that. This uh, graphic I find particularly interesting, again, from the Health Affairs article. And what it shows are the number of ACOs or ranges uh, across the country. And um, what I find particularly interesting is the high proliferation of ACOs in Texas, for instance, and the very small number of ACOs um, that are occurring or, or that have been developed in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and the Dakotas. Same thing is true to New Mexico, but to a lesser extent. So you can see that there is one part of the country, this central northern part of the country, um, which has very, where there are very few uh, ACOs. And that is um, something that is changing. The majority of calls that I receive about ACOs are uh, states uh, or, or provider groups in states that have very few ACOs and are wanting to develop them. Um, this is the number of ACO lives covered. So this is the number of people who are covered through an ACO. Uh, over time, and you can see that uh, currently it's about 28.3 million. It's actually a little bit higher than that because that's as of January 30th. And so we can sort of look at trends. Now, I want you to remember that there are private 
ACOs that, are, that work with commercial insurers, and then there are the Medicare ACOs. Um, the Medicare ACOs, like everything that CMS does, sort of blazes the trail and um, provides the essential quality metrics and, and other things along those lines. Uh, so we talk a lot about the Medical Shared Savings Program and Medicare ACOs, but don't, please don't forget that, that ACOs can be uh, through private insurance as well. So the Shared Savings Program has now been in operation for three performance years. Um, initial participants have had an opportunity to renew their contracts for another performance period. Typically contracts are for a minimum of three years. And so we're now at that point where we're starting to see who is renewing. And that has been a, 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 a milestone that uh, healthcare experts have wanted to see because knowing who will renew and how many are renewing gives us an idea of how successful ACOs are. Um, of the 220 Medicare ACOs that were eligible for renewal in 2016, 147 have renewed. Eight have transitioned to the next generation ACO program, and additional eight combined are merged with other ACOs. So as you can see, the majority of existing uh, shared saving program ACOs um, have re-upped for the program. That means that three quarters of the early Medicare ACOs are continuing onward with the Medicare ACO program. In addition, a number of those that left the Medicare program continued with commercial ACO contracts. So they're continuing to work in ACO models, but, but not under the Medicare program. And even though the Medicare uh, Shared Savings Program receives the most attention, commercial contracts tend to be larger and cover more lives. They collectively represent a larger portion of the ACO population, as this next graphic shows. And this is typically a surprise, um, but as you can see, the majority of covered lives are under commercial ACO programs as opposed to Medicaid or Medicare. And that brings me to a, something I don't want to forget. Um, there are Medicaid ACO programs, particularly Oregon has a very active Medicaid ACO uh, program um, that is covering uh, Medicaid patients. Um, as I mentioned earlier, showing you the graphic of the states, ACO percentage of lives that are covered by an ACO um, varies widely by geographic region. States such as Oregon that have adopted Medicaid ACOs tend to have a higher penet penetration of ACOs available. Nationally, 8.9% of the population is covered by ACOs, and that's approximately 22% of Medicare beneficiaries that are covered by 477 Medicare ACOs nationwide. So, while they're a growing model and, and a very, um, one that is attracting a lot of attention and emphasis, uh, especially from CMS, they are far from the dominant model of healthcare coverage. And here again is the penetration by state. This is the number or percentage of ACO lives. So um, you can see that while the states that have the fewest ACOs, that being Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and the Dakotas, they do have a high percentage of lives because there is there are large active ACOs in those states. However, what we're what we're hearing is that those states want to have a greater proliferation of ACOs. So let's talk about some typical attributes of an ACO. Uh, I get this question a lot. What do we need to look like? What is what does an ACO need to have, or what does a group need to have to become an ACO? And what we typically talk about is that there needs to be doctors of many specialties who can work together. Um, and you want a number of physician practices in the ACO so that patients can choose among several providers. They have to be easy access to specialists, which reduce delays and facilitates easier care coordination. So again, you don't want to have an ACO that's just primary care. Typically, an ACO would include primary care and other specialists. Um, that is what helps bring down costs. And all doctors, whether they be primary care or specialists, have access to the patient's electronic medical record and can share information through a confidential electronic computer system. The ultimate goal is a fully integrated system in which the electronic medical record is also available for participating hospitals. Again, this IT piece of, AC, of ACOs is, uh, is a cornerstone. 
Also, um, among the attributes of ACOs, patients receive supportive services and preventative care. So again, heavy on the preventative care as opposed to reactionary care. Um, this includes health educators, nurses, nutrition, counseling, et cetera. Um, and typically those are in close proximity uh, to the primary care physician's office. The group uses medical teams to allow for 24 access to medical services, and this team has access to the patient's full medical record. There is ease of obtaining labs, x-rays, physical ther therapy, and other services, which are located within or near the patient's doctor's office, and may also share information and computer systems. And the group regularly conducts surveys rating the care patients receive and has a means of assessing the quality of care patients receive so the group and each participating doctor can be held accountable for delivering high quality care. Again, coordination. And let me say coordination and um, responsibility. So the other piece of advice that I give to groups that are considering becoming or forming an ACO is that the group has to be able to work together um, but it also must be accountable uh, to one another. So if you have physicians who don't want to use um, health technology, uh, they don't want to use electronic medical records, or they don't want to be have a scorecard or a dashboard, um, they are typically not physicians who will fit well within the ACO model. Going to private ACOs for just one minute, um, these ACOs can include hospitals, specialists, post-acute care providers, just like the governmental ACOs, um, but they can also include private companies like Walgreens. Uh, the only must-have element in pri is primary care physicians, as I mentioned, who are the linchpin of the program. And in private ACOs, insurers can also play a role, uh, although they're not in charge of medical care, obviously. Um, Subregions of the country, including parts of California, already have large multi-specialty physician groups that became ACOs on their own by networking with neighboring hospitals. So um, many of, of these groups formed private ACOs, particularly in California, which had such um, a vast experience with ACO-type models with Kaiser. In other regions, large hospital systems uh, have been buying up physician practice groups with the goal of becoming ACOs that directly employ the, major of, the majority of their providers. And then there are some large health insurers in the country, including Humana, Health, uh, United Health, and Aetna, that have formed their own ACOs for the private market. And it's interesting, if you talk to um, particularly Humana, they will say that assurers are essential to the success of an ACO because they track and collect the data on patients that allow systems to evaluate patient care and report on the results. Their position, the insurer's position, is that they are already so used to the data analytics uh, and other data collection, quality measure collection, that um, becoming part of an ACO is a logical uh, extension of, of their abilities and what they bring to the table um, and can really help with ACOs. So uh, lots of private ACOs are directly, and tied, directly tied to a major insurer. Um, one of the questions that I get often, and I just decided to put it into a slide, is uh, how is an ACO different from a health maintenance organization? And I actually, um, there, there's a, a wonderful uh, health care uh, policy person out there by the name of Harold Miller who uh, says that sometimes ACOs are, are, are called um, HMOs in drag, but they're really not um, because ACO patients are not required to stay in network. So an ACO participant, patient participant, is a Medicare on the governmental side is a government is a is a excuse me Medicare fee for service beneficiary, and they can go anywhere they want. They don't have to stay within the ACO, which is essentially different than the HMO model. Um, and the other thing to remember is that while ACOs are becoming more pervasive and are continuing to grow, most uh, policy experts do not consider them the end game. The ultimate goal uh, will be for providers to take full financial responsibility for caring for a population of patients for a fixed payment, which is something that is beyond the ACO at this point. ACOs at this point can share in, in savings and share in losses, but they are a step or two below total full financial responsibility um, by providers for a population. So. 
I think that is worth remembering. Remembering uh, ACOs are not the all, be all excuse me, be all and end all, nor where we think uh, CMS is ultimately trying to reach. I think that the end game for CMS is full financial responsibility for physicians for a for a defined population. So let's talk about Medicare ACOs because they provide the most rules and the most guidance in terms of how ACOs operate. And again, please remember that private ACOs uh, can vary widely, uh, whereas the Medicare ACOs are, are more streamlined and more um, defined because uh, of CMS's requirements. So as I mentioned, Section 3022 of the ACA required the Secretary of Health and Human Services to create a new type of healthcare entity, the ACO, uh, that agrees to be held accountable for the quality and experience of care for a population of assigned Medicare beneficiaries while reducing the rate of growth in healthcare spending for the population. Again, it applies only to Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. Providers within the ACO are jointly accountable for the health of their patients and receive financial incentives to cooperate and save money by avoiding unnecessary tests and procedures. One of the hallmarks of ACOs are um, removing duplication of services, using best practices, um, forming or, or creating um, patient protocols um, or treatment protocols, uh, working in teams, um, shared appointments, these kinds of, of things that uh, typically reduce cost by reducing duplication and, um, and increased coordination. Those that save money while also meeting quality targets keep a portion of the savings. That's why it's called the Shared Savings Program. Providers can choose to be at risk of losing money if they want to aim for bigger reward, or they can enter the program at no risk at all. Now, please notice that that says they can enter the program at no risk at all. You can't stay in the program indefinitely at no risk. But brand new ACOs can, can start in with no risk, um, but their reward is not as high. And in 2014, uh, the third year of the Medicare ACO program, 97 ACOs qualified for shared saving payments of more than $422 million. So there really is uh, some um, significant shared savings out there, um, 97 ACOs shared more than $422 million. In addition to the Medicare Shared Savings Program, CMS created a secondary strategy called the Pioneer Program, the Pioneer ACO Program, for high-performing health systems to pocket more of the expected savings in exchange for taking on greater financial risk. Uh, in 2014, the 20 Pioneer Program ACOs and 333 participants in the Medicare Shared Savings Program generated $411 million in total savings. You'll notice there that, however, after paying bonuses, uh, there was a loss of $2.6 million to the Medicare Trust Fund. Uh, that is not a fact that is particularly upsetting to CMS in any way. Um, they see this as, as getting programs um, online and uh, teaching them how to become successful in ACOs. So that loss was not considered a, a, a large problem. And I say that just to point out that CMS is, um, has not shown any um, indication that it is no longer supporting or, in fact, not pushing um, stringently uh, ACO models. They like them very much. So I want to talk a little bit about the 2015 final rule provisions, because there were some substantive changes in the 20, uh, 2015 final rule um, that are worth noting. These include um, the following. CMS distinguishes between ACOs, serving Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries only, and private managed care plans offered under the Medicare Advantage program. So uh, ACOs are part of the traditional fee-for-service program, and beneficiaries continue to be able to seek any Medicare enrolled provider they choose which is different for beneficiaries under Part C or Medicare Advantage program. Under the Shared Savings Program, CMS assesses uh, a C uh, an ACO's quality and financial performance based on a population of assigned beneficiaries to determine whether the ACO has met the quality performance standards 
and reduced growth and expenditures compared to a historical financial benchmark. That is the key uh, change uh, or, or addition to the 2015 final rule was this um, assessment of ACOs for both financial and quality performance. ACOs that meet or exceed the minimum savings rate, you'll see it's called the MSR, and satisfy minimum quality performance standards are eligible to receive a portion of the savings they generate, in other words, the shared savings. There are notification requirements that came out of the uh, 2015 final rule. Uh, the regulations require providers and suppliers who are referred to as ACO participants to notify beneficiaries that they are participating in an ACO and that the ACO is eligible for additional Medicare payments if it satisfies certain quality performance standards while reducing growth in costs. The beneficiary may choose to stay with the ACO or seek care elsewhere, but the important part is the ACO has let the beneficiary know that they are participating uh, in an ACO, uh, that their care will be provided by the ACO, um, so that they have the choice. And it's interesting. Um, lots of Medicare beneficiaries say, I think that because they are sharing in the savings, my care will suffer. And others uh, have said, no, no, I much prefer that quality measures are um, affecting uh, the shared savings that an ACO receives, and therefore I think my care is improved. I saw an interesting study about that, um, and it just seems to break that some beneficiaries see it as a positive and some see it as a negative. I think the uh, trend is clearly that more and more beneficiaries uh, who didn't even realize they were in an ACO until they received uh, notice have said, no, I like my care, I like my doc, this is working fine. And this is certainly the model of the future. Uh, the ACO must also notify the beneficiary that the beneficiary's Medicare claims data may be shared with the ACO. So um, beneficiaries can de de decline data sharing by calling the number that is there on the slide. Um, and data sharing is limited to the purposes of the Shared Savings Program and require compliance with all applicable privacy rules and regulations. So as part of the ACO's notification to beneficiaries, it should include that they can decline and also that it's still subject to all HIPAA and other privacy rules. There are eligibility requirements. Um, the following types of groups of providers and suppliers may form an ACO. ACO professional, and I'm going to give you a definition of what an ACO professional is, but essentially it is physicians and certain non-physician practitioners in practice group arrangements. Uh, also, networks of individual practices uh, can become ACOs, very much like an independent practice association or a clinically integrated network. Partnerships or joint venture arrangements between hospitals and ACOs, um, that, that can uh, be a, they, they can form an ACO. Hospitals employing ACO professionals or other Medicare providers and suppliers as determined by the secretary. And you'll notice that this, the regulation says specifically as determined by the secretary. Uh, none of us really understood what that meant when the, the regulation first came out, but we have since seen that uh, the Secretary has allowed certain critical access hospitals and federally qualified health centers, as well as rural health clinics, to form ACOs independent of the Shared Savings Program. So there is discretion by the Secretary, and we've seen uh, that some entities that don't fall within the first four categories on the slide uh, have formed ACOs outside of the Shared Savings Program. Uh, that should read ACO professional, sorry, not ACL. There's, um, there's no knee injury involved here. Um, an ACO pro uh, professional means an individual who is a Medicare enrolled and bills for items and services furnished to Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries under a Medicare billing number assigned to the 10 as an ACO participant in accordance with applicable Medicare regulations. Um, and that basically means physicians who are legally authorized to practice medicine um, and surgery in a state, as well as practitioners that include physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and clinical nurse specialists. I've given you the site there for the definition. But essentially, a, an ACO professional is any Medicare enrolled practitioner who bills and, um, for items and services furnished to Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. 
Eligibility requirements, an ACO must have at least 5,000 assigned Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries to be eligible to participate in the Shared Savings Program. And the ACO is responsible for routine self-assessment, monitoring, and reporting of the care it delivers to continuously improve the care delivered to their Medicare beneficiary. Another hallmark of ACOs is this uh, consistent and constant assessment, monitoring, and reporting to effectuate improvement. A prospective shared savings program ACO must complete an application providing information requested by CMS, including how the ACO plans to deliver high quality care and lower the rate of growth and expenditures. Um, if the ACO's application is approved, the ACO must sign an agreement with CMS to participate in the shared savings program for a period of at least three years. And it is important to note that ACOs are not automatically accepted into the shared savings program. In fact, initially, uh, the majority of ACOs that applied to be in the shared savings program were denied uh, for one deficiency or the other. Um, that's becoming much more standardized now as ACOs get more experience and folks get more experience and there's more entities out there to help uh, groups that want to become ACOs. Um, but, it, but the fact that you have formed an ACO or, or an entity has formed an ACO does not necessarily mean that it will automatically be accepted into the shared savings program. The monitoring uh, that is one of the hallmarks of ACOs. Um, monitoring includes analyzing claims and specific financial and quality data, as well as the quarterly and annual aggregate reports. Um, CMS may also perform site visits and reviewing the results of beneficiary surveys. So, CMS is involved in all of these monitoring activities and they expect ACOs to do the same. Participation in the program may also include audits by CMS if necessary, and the failure to comply with eligibility and program requirements, including avoidance, excuse me, avoidance of at-risk beneficiaries and failure to meet quality performance standards may result in termination of the agreement by CMS that actually has occurred. There has been some terminations by CMS. So, the other hallmark um, of an ACO is tying payment to improved care at lower cost. So under the program, Medicare continues to pay individual providers and suppliers for specific items and services furnished to Medicare beneficiaries on a fee-for-service payment system. So practitioners continue to be paid fee-for-service. In order to determine whether an ACO is to, reserve, is to receive shared savings or is responsible for shared losses, that's for those people who are in that arrangement. CMS develops a financial benchmark based on historical expenditures for beneficiaries assigned to the ACO. In addition, the amount of an ACO shared savings or losses depends on its quality performance. So there are several factors going on here, the first being whether, you're, whether an ACO is meeting um, its financial uh, benchmarks and then whether that entity is also meeting its quality performance benchmarks. Uh, with respect to quality performance measures, um, these are always interesting because they uh, tend to be in flux, but as I pointed out, uh, CMS has, has a, has a lot of experience with quality measures, and so a lot of these same quality measures are being adopted by uh, private ACOs, although I've also seen private ACOs that are saying we don't want to go with CMS benchmarks and we want to create our own. So in any, any case, ACOs must have procedures and processes in place to promote evidence-based medicine, beneficiary engagement, and coordination of care, those being the three central um, aspects of the quality measures, again, evidence-based medicine, beneficiary engagement, and coordination of care. ACOs must report quality measures to CMS and give timely feedback to providers and suppliers for continuous improvement of care to beneficiaries. And I just want to highlight this. It isn't enough just to report quality metrics to CMS. Um, CMS is also requiring that, that information be provided to providers within the ACO uh, with the idea of those providers continually improving um, care to their beneficiaries. In addition, CMS expects that ACOs invest continuously in the workforce and team-based care. This is another uh, 
major um, new initiative by CMS, this team-based care and um, investment in workforce. To promote transparency, ACOs are required to publicly report certain aspects of their performance and operations, and CMS publicly reports quality and financial performance data on, uh, on the website, you see the site there, and CMS's Physician Compare website. So again, increased transparency, uh, ACOs uh, consider that a hallmark as well. In terms of the specific quality performance measures, there are 34 uh, under the Shared Savings Program um, in order to be able to share in the shared savings. Um, these 34 measures cover four quality domains, including patient experience of care, care coordination and patient safety, preventative health, and at-risk populations. The ACO quality measures align with those used in other CMS quality programs such as the Physician Quality Reporting System and the Electronic Health Record Incentive Programs. So these won't uh, look uh, very new if you take a look at them, but uh, there is a site for the 2016 ACO quality measures uh, so that you can go take a look at those. Uh, again, they look an awful lot like the um, PQRS system uh, and other quality metrics that we've seen out of uh, CMS now for, for many, many years. So how does this all work? Well, an ACO that meets the program's quality performance standards may receive a share of the savings if its assigned beneficiary expenditures are below its own specific updated expenditure benchmark for a specified, by a specified percentage. Okay, let me break that down a little bit. So if an ACO has already met the financial benchmark, then if they also meet the quality benchmark, they are eligible to receive a portion of the shared savings. Those ACOs that choose to participate in a two-sided performance-based risk model accountable for sharing losses are required to repay Medicare for a portion of losses, um, which are the expenditures above the ACO's updated benchmark by a specified percentage. I know that is a complicated sentence and it's a complicated um, concept, until you, until you drill down and start uh, playing with specific examples. But uh, the, the concept, again, that I just want to make clear that you understand today is that there are benchmarks both for savings, so you have to, have, you have to meet certain financial um, benchmarks as well as quality. So let's drill down a little bit into the Medicare Shared Savings Program specifically. Um, there are multiple tracks, and you will see documents out there that say there are two tracks under the Shared Savings Program, and that there are three tracks. I have, for simplicity's sake, kept it at two tracks, track one being a no-risk model, and track two being the at-risk model. Uh, however, if you are looking at publications from CMS, and like I said, they, they, they have publications out of CMS directly that, that refers to two tracks, and then there are the three tracks. But if you're looking at the three-track model, tracks two and three are both at-risk models and they have a different percentage of um, potential upside. So looking at track one allows an ACO to operate on a shared savings only arrangement, so no risk for losses, for, duration, for the duration of its first agreement. Those ACOs that wish to continue participating in the shared savings program beyond the first agreement period must do so in track two. As I mentioned earlier, you can only be at no risk for the first um, uh, period, uh, first uh, arrangement. Under the Track 2, the ACO shares in both savings and losses for all years of the agreement. With this model, the ACO will be eligible for a higher sh sharing rate with a higher performance payment limit um, than is available under the one-sided model. So obviously, if you're willing to take on risk, there's greater reward. And obviously, that's the rationale that I, I just mentioned. Um, CMS has created two tracks to provide organizations with less experience with risk models, such as some physician-driven organizations or smaller ACOs, to gain experience with population management before transitioning to the risk-based model. At the same time, they also want to provide an opportunity for more experienced ACOs that are ready to share in losses, to enter in sharing arrangements to provide a greater share of the savings, but at the risk of repaying Medicare 
care for a portion of losses. So the next several slides go through the steps that CMS performs in, a, in assessing um, savings and losses. And as you can see, step one is the establishment of a benchmark and update for each performance year within the agreement. So there's the establishment of an initial benchmark and then there's, it's updated for each performance year within the agreement. The minimum agreement period is three years, but you can agree to a larger or a longer period of time. I know some ACOs that are in five-year arrangements with CMS have not yet had to decide whether they're going to re-up uh, or continue with the uh, shared savings program, um, but it is updated for each performance year. The benchmarks are established for each agreement using the most recent available three years of per beneficiary expenditures for parts A and B, services for Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries assigned to that ACO. And then the benchmarks are also adjusted for beneficiary characteristics excuse me, characteristics, and such other factors as the secretary determines appropriate. Again, I'm not going to drill down too um, deep into these details. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be glad to go over any of these aspects with you. But uh, given our short period of time, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on these. But suffice it to say that there is an initial benchmark and it is updated. Um, the original benchmark is adjusted using the hierarchical condition categories, the HCC, risk adjustment models that were originally developed in conjunction with Medicare Managed Care or Medicare Advantage program. Um, the HCC risk adjustment model is used to calculate expected expenditures for the population of Medicare beneficiaries. And although costs for an individual beneficiary may be higher or lower than expected, these variations are likely to balance each other across the population. That's at least the um, reasoning. But to minimize variation, uh, they, um, they truncate it to 99th percentile of national Medicare fee-for-service expenditures as determined for each benchmark year. That is to take out some of the uh, risk of variation. In addition, uh, CMS trends the benchmark years toward the third benchmark year by employing the national growth rate in Medicare Parts A and B expenditures for fee-for-service beneficiaries. So it weights it as 60% uh, for benchmark year three, 30% for benchmark year two, and 10% for benchmark year one. Um, that basically allows them to establish a lower minimum savings rate, MSRs, since the weighting results in more accurate benchmarks. And each year of the agreement period, CMS updates the ACO's benchmark by the projected absolute amount of growth in national per capita expenditures for Parts A and B services under the original Medicare fee-for-service fee program using data from the CS, CMS Office of Actuary. So again, they're constantly fiddling with the numbers to try to make it fair, but you do need to understand that you'll be subject to an initial benchmark and an update for every year of the agreement. The second step is to compare performance to the benchmark to determine shared savings and losses. An ACO is eligible and only eligible for payment of shared savings if the estimated average per capita Medicare expenditure for Parts A and B services adjusted for beneficiary characteristics, and I'm quoting here from the statute, is at least the percentage specified by the secretary below the applicable benchmark. Again, a very confusing term. We didn't really know or understand how that might look. Um, we're getting a better idea now that we've now that we're in in performance year three. Um, to account for normal variation, the CMS uh, establishes the MSR. Again, not to go too far into the weeds on this, but the next slide explains how that works in the one-sided model and also how it works in the two-sided model. Uh, the issue with the two-sided model, of course, is that you're not just responsible or, or not just eligible for shared savings, but you're also responsible for shared losses. So uh, these next two slides explain in detail how that is calculated. Uh, and specifically, um, the, the next slide here that I'm coming to explains how shared losses are calculated. Let me get there. Then the third step is determining um, shared rates and shared savings. So uh, it isn't that you just get to share in uh, all 
all of the uh, savings that may have been accomplished by forming an ACO or being part of an ACO. Um, there are limits on that. And so if an ACO meets quality standards and achieves savings according to step two, the ACO will share in savings. Again, we're back to the quality metrics. First, you have to meet the financial benchmark, then the quality. CMS applies a sharing rate determined for each ACO based on its quality performance. That is the difference between the updated benchmark and the actual expenditures for the performance year. And an ACO shares in savings at this rate on a first dollar basis up to the performance payment limit. So there is a limit on shared savings. The next slide goes through the one-sided model. Um, an ACO may earn uh, a sharing rate of 50% based on quality performance in the one-sided model, and that goes up to 60% in the two-sided model. Likewise, the payment performance limit is 10% under the one-sided model and 15% um, under the two-sided model. Again, if you're willing to accept risk, the, uh, uh, the benefits increase as well. I've, th this following uh, slide goes a little bit farther into the weeds. I don't think that that's necessary to cover here, but I wanted you to have the information uh, should you be dealing with um, calculation of shared savings and losses. Again, uh, the next slide also gets a little bit uh, further into the details of how um, the shared savings and losses are determined. Uh, but there is um, sharing limits, as I mentioned, uh, that change depending on whether you're under the one-sided model or the two-sided model. Again, I wanted to get this down so you had this information if you're dealing with it, but uh, just talking about it without actual numbers in front of you um, or without the actual statute in front of you can be kind of confusing, so I'll leave it to the slide. Over the last couple of months, I've gotten a bunch of questions about the advanced payment ACO model. And I think this is because um, we're starting to see ACOs developing in rural areas. And uh, knowing that amongst um, Holland and Hart's footprint, there are uh, lots of providers in rural areas. Um, we have lots of clients that are in rural areas. Um, we're seeing more interest in the advanced payment ACO model. So I wanted to go through just some critical issues with it. Um, the advanced payment model was an initiative developed by the Innovation Center. So as you may recall, the ACA created the Innovation Center that has a great leeway and ability to uh, try out different programs. And so the advanced payment model came directly from the Innovation Center. And uh, it was designed for organizations participating in ACOs in the shared savings program. Through the advanced payment model, selected participants in the shared savings program receive advanced payments that will be recouped from the shared savings they earn. So in other words, it's a way of getting an advanced payment. And the whole idea here is to help ACOs develop in rural areas that may not be able to do so because of financial constraints. There are certainly upfront financial costs to forming or developing an ACO. And so this advanced payment model was intended to try to help with that and the idea is they'll advance payments, CMS will advance payments to a new ACO and recoup those payments from shared savings. The advanced payment model was specifically created by the Innovation Center to test whether providing an advance in the form of upfront payments to be repaid in the future increases participation in the shared savings program and whether advanced payments allow ACOs to improve care for beneficiaries, generate Medicare savings more quickly, and increase the amount of Medicare savings. That's what the Innovation Center is testing. Uh, what the future will be of the advanced payment model will have a lot to do with what they find and the results that they find, but that is the, the basis for uh, creating this model. There uh, are three different payments uh, under the advanced payment model, there's an upfront fixed payment. So just by participating in this model, you get an upfront fixed payment. Then there's also an upfront variable payment. So each ACO receives a payment based on the number of its historically assigned beneficiaries. And so the, vari the variation there is the number of beneficiaries. And then there's also a monthly payment of varying amounts depending on the size of the ACO. So the third pay advanced payment uh, 
received by an ACO is a monthly payment based on the number of its historically assigned beneficiaries. The structure of these and payments is intended to address both the fixed and variable costs associated with forming an ACO. As I just mentioned, there are upfront costs, upfront fixed costs that may be um, IT, uh, uh, EHRs, other, in other forms of information, health technology, or health information technology, but also variable costs associated with forming ACOs that include things like monitoring, um, dashboards, uh, updating doctors, um, performing um, regular meetings of the physicians to talk about best practices and the like. So uh, it's meant, these advanced payments are meant to address both the fixed and the um, variable costs that are uh, a, just a necessary part of an ACO. CMS then recoups advanced payments through the ACO's earned shared savings. And again, there's lots of detail here, or there's some detail here, um, but it's important to remember that if the ACO does not generate sufficient savings to repay the advance payments as of the settlement schedule for the shared savings program, participants midway through the ACO's second performance year, CMS will recoup the balance from the earned shared savings in the subsequent performance year. That's the question I get a lot from practices is what if we can't repay? Uh, what do we do then? Um, and it's also important to note that CMS will not pursue recoupment uh, on any remaining balance of advance payments after the CEO, ACO completes the first agreement period. So if the ACO is not successful and cannot repay, uh, CMS will not come after them after the, after the first agreement period. Um, however, CMS will pursue full recoupment of advance payments from an, any ACO that does not complete the full initial agreement period. So key to having that debt forgiven, basically, is completing um, the first initial agreement period. This is the most critical uh, part, I think, for practice groups to understand who are looking at the advanced payment model. Um, it is only open to two types of organize, organizations participating in the shared savings program. Those are ACOs that do not include any inpatient facility and have less than $50 million in total annual revenue. Again, trying to get to the rural areas. And the second type of uh, ACO that is eligible to participate in the advanced payment model are those in which the only inpatient facilities are critical access hospitals and or Medicare low volume rural hospitals and have less than $80 million in total annual revenue. Again, trying to give a leg up to uh, ACOs in rural areas and get them going. Um, only ACOs that entered the Shared Savings Program in April 2012 or July 2012 are eligible for advance payments. There is some indication that CMS is going to open that up, uh, depending on what they're finding, but right now, the only ACOs that can participate are those that entered the Shared Savings Program in April or July of 2012. And ACOs that are co-owned, excuse me, co-owned with a health plan are ineligible, regardless of whether they fall into one of the other categories. And the scoring criteria for evaluating applications favors ACOs with the least access to capital, ACOs that serve rural populations, and ACOs that serve a significant number of Medicaid, not Medicare, but Medicaid beneficiaries. So again, uh, the Innovation Center is trying to push the ACO model and help rural areas, smaller providers, smaller ACOs um, to um, uh, uh, succeed uh, in the ACO model. There was a final rule um, that was uh, just published uh, in June of 2016. Uh, it is mostly highly technical uh, stuff. Um, the rule itself is called revised benchmark, excuse me, revised benchmark rebasing methodology, facilitating transition to performance-based risk and administrative finality of final calculation. So that gives you an idea of the technical issues. Because they are so highly technical, I'm not going to go into those uh, here. We have neither the time nor is it um, particularly interesting. Um, it, is, it pertains to people who are, are already deeply in ACOs, but the uh, slide 56 goes through uh, what the three basic elements of the final rule include, and I'll leave those to your reading. 
The other issue that I hear most are what are key considerations for groups considering um, forming an ACO or improving on their ACO? And I've whittled them down to four, but if you, um, it, there, there are lots of publications out there that have, you know, the six critical or the 10 critical or the 17 critical issues. Um, I just wanted to cover, I think, the four most critical cost. Uh, there is definitely a cost um, involved in creating and developing uh, an ACO, but it is also successful ACOs will lower total expected cost of care. And so that's uh, one key issue to consider, to consider. The second is physician alignment, and that should be and integration, not and integration. So physician alignment and integration are key for the success of an ACO. Um, ACOs must have a strong affiliation between the physicians and especially strong primary care physicians to coordinate the care of, of patients within the ACO. And you have to be able to create true integration. Physicians with the ACO must overcome attitudes favoring autonomy over coordination. I've worked with a couple of different uh, groups that had older physicians in it who really wanted to stay um, autonomous. And I think the better model for them is uh, independent physician association. Um, they, they don't do as well in ACOs because they really don't like being part of the team. Um, they also sometimes bristle at report cards um, being held accountable um, for duplication of services or not using established practice protocols, that type of thing. So one of the key issues is uh, integration. Um, and then ACOs must have certain core competencies. There must be leadership within a group wishing to become an ACO. Um, in ACOs that are not successful, that's often the thing that we see that is missing. There has to be operational management to identify and disseminate best practices that promote efficacy of care, delivery, improved quality of care, and reduce costs within the organization. There has to be a good governance uh, body, uh, some, some group within the ACO uh, that will handle governance. And then there has to be technological know-how. If you're dealing with a group of physicians who are considering becoming an ACO and they don't have any interest in the technology, uh, it's going to be a hard push for them. Then there are also critical relationships. And the high acuity diagnoses requiring tertiary referrals and post-acute care are two critical drivers of healthcare costs. ACOs need to be aware of that, and they need to have the kinds of relationships uh, that will foster that. Uh, with the increase in bundled payment models and other value-based reimbursements that include continuum of care, creating relationships with the most efficient providers uh, is uh, in the ACO's best interest. Again, providers should be evaluated and engaged in discussions around reducing costs while improving care. And then the final consideration that I consider key is health information. I'll leave that to you to read, but uh, it isn't just having an EHR or an EMR. Uh, it's, it's really having an integrated um, technology so that all the different groups within the ACO are talking to each other and so that patients are being tracked as well as quality measures. There are other key considerations um, I think that you have to consider, and those are regulatory issues. Uh, ACOs can run up against problems with antitrust, um, as well as anti-referral, the Stark Law, uh, anti-kickback, civil monetary penalties. Um, and so there are uh, regulatory issues that you should also be aware, with, aware of and, uh, and very cognizant of because they carry such enormous penalties. I, we have just a couple of minutes, but I just want to uh, mention a couple of things. I'm going to pass up uh, policy drivers. Suffice it to say that um, everything that we're seeing out of CMS continues to suggest that value-based payments is where they are going and where we will uh, inevitably uh, will be the, the driver for all future models. Um, we expect um, ACOs to continue to grow. With the uh, passage of the MARCA law, um, there is strong bipartisan push that we're seeing throughout Congress um, for transition toward uh, value-based models. Um, and more importantly, the objective of ACOs is not just payment reform, it's reform it is delivery of care reform, uh, delivery reform. And so that's one of the, the primary things that we are uh, seeing uh, in the ACO model. So um, 
we anticipate to see greater emphasis on ACOs and greater proliferation of ACOs, especially in rural areas. Um, in addition, we think that there will be enormous incentives um, for physicians to change how they deliver care, and we're going to continue to see uh, these incentives, uh, these financial incentives, as a way of achieving that goal. Um, we've seen it with the bundled payment programs. We're seeing it with all the new value-based payment programs. Um, when you're dealing with fee-for-service models like Medicare fee-for-service um, outside of Part C, the incentives are in shared savings but all of the efforts right now by CMS, as well as private insurers, are toward uh, value and risk-based programs. So I hope that that gives you uh, an overview of ACOs. I wanted to quickly remind you of our future webinar schedule, which is on slide 67. And then again, if you have questions or need additional information, please feel free to contact me. If, um, if you have issues that you would like to see us um, discuss or, or talk about or, or, or present on in future webinars, please let us know because uh, the whole goal here is to provide information that is important to the community and, um, and to folks out there. So if there are things that you'd particularly like to hear or uh, talk about, uh, don't hesitate to drop us a line and let us know. Uh, these materials will be on our website. Uh, you should have received uh, a reminder of today's webinar that had the materials attached. So if you don't, uh, don't get those or can't find them, please let me know and I'll be sure to get them to you. With that, I'll close. Uh, thank you very, very much for attending. And uh, again, please let us know uh, your thoughts and, um, and we'll try to incorporate those in future presentations. Thank you. Bye-bye.